Welcome, everybody, to the Brian Foltis Behavioral Finance Podcast. My name is Brian Foltis, and today we are continuing part three of our personal finance saga here, teaching our kids about money. Thank you for joining today, and I hope everybody's doing well. As we jump in today, I am going to point out five things that I've identified as important teaching points to at least start a conversation with our children and to keep that conversation going. And I realized that many of us in our own worlds, we never had anybody to talk to in our finan- about finances to. And I'm hoping part of what I'm trying to do is to change that dialogue. And so right off the bat, I'm telling you, even if you don't feel equipped to talk or teach your parent or your kids about money, let's figure out a way to get around that and realize that nobody's perfect. If anybody is a parent, we all realize there is no such thing as a perfect parent. Same thing applies to talking to your kids about money. However, that doesn't mean that we should not talk about it even if we're not perfect in our own lives. So that's what this podcast is going to be for. Trying to figure out what are the things to talk to your kids about, some of the important messages to take home, and then essentially sometimes when to hold back and to let our kids experience some of these financial decisions on their own for them to actually get this experiential learning. So, uh, quick update. All is good here on the home front. We are heading into spring break time, and my intention is to continue to record podcasts as I move into spring break. How many of you know professors need spring break too? and we will go, I'll be going to Mexico and doing a conference there, speaking at a a conference, presenting some of my research, and then wink, wink, tying on that trip into my own time. So this will be fun. I'm looking forward to having a trip by myself, actually. No kids, no wife, just alone time. I'm looking forward to it as much as I love my family and spending time with my wife and kids. It's also nice to uh, have a little alone time as well. Anyway, for five points to talk about, we're going to just jump right in now. Number one is, this sounds pretty obvious, but openly talk about it. Have the conversations about money, all things have the conversation. Do not avoid it. Now, of course, this is coming from my personal experience. We're going to avoid, we're going to talk about things, confrontational things, which we avoided as kids. Uh, We're going to bring that out. And the same thing about money. Talk about it openly. So some of the things that we mean by talking about it openly, how much do things cost? This one is an open dialogue about, hey, How much are things, do they actually cost? I have a lot of seniors in college who don't know what a lot of things cost. And so they really struggle to get out from graduation and realize that your cell phone, if you have a cell phone here in the U.S., it's going to run you, if you want decent service, around $70 to $80 a month. And... Mommy and daddy have been paying for this the whole time and never tell them the cost. And so just by showing costs, here's how much things cost. Here's how much our house costs. Here's how much uh, dinner costs. Can you help me calculate the tip based off of this? How much should we give off of this? Some of these things you can start quite early just by planting the seeds. Here's how much it costs. Um, And then as they get older, they can come in to the decision-making conversation. And that is the second part of this, how much do things cost, is the rationalization of why or why we don't buy things. 
And here's one thing that I refrain from saying with our kids is we don't say we can't afford it. We can't afford it because that is just not a question that we should be asking in the first place. There are a lot of things that I can afford, but I know wouldn't serve us the best way. If you know what I mean. I could go out and buy it or I could afford it. So it's really not the question. It's more or less coming down to, is this the best utilization of our money? Would this give us a good return? And sometimes the answer is yes. Hey, if we want to do a trip or if we want to have an experience and we can justify it, then yes, let's go ahead and make this purchase. But it's not a can we afford it or not. It's a we, do we want to allocate our resources and our money in this direction? Um, and, and then go, go from there. But also bring them into the conversation that some things go up in price over time, some things go down in price over time, and get them to start thinking about these things that, hey, you know, your, your V-Bucks that you're spending your money on on your Xbox, what are those going to give you, and will they sustain you compared to something that is going to appreciate over time? Uh, so more on that in a moment, but along these lines of openly talking about it is really working around uh, these social norms, but also this illusion of wealth that people lead on. So remember, friends, the default here in the United States is broke. The normal in the United States is broke. It's an average, an average of $730 car payment a month per car so that means households down the street are paying fourteen hundred sixty dollars a month for their cars that sit in their driveway that take them back and forth to work so whenever i'm talking to my students i have them do the math and i tell them that man you scrub out the math if you're doing a sixty thousand dollar a year job sixty thousand dollars a year in your salary and you have essentially after insurance and taxes, you're going to be $5,000 a month and you're going to make about $3,600 net after taxes. So I'll even round up. I'll go $3,700. That includes no uh, insurance or retirement payments, but around $3,700 a month. And if you're working on average 40 hours a week, let's say you get four weeks off. So that's just to keep the math simple. That's 160 hours working a week. You're at $23.13 per hour. $23.1825 per hour. That means if you're at $730 divided by that hourly rate, 23 and 1 eighth, you are working 31.57 hours for the car that you're driving to the job that you may or may not like. Isn't that some shit? <laughs> Yet we do it. So anyway... The whole thing that we're talking about is you have all these zombie people walking around doing dumb shit, driving this car that they can't afford to a job that they don't like, and you're going to spend almost one week paying for that. The point is, why did I get myself fired up for that? Darn it. Is when you are out and about and you are seeing all of these nice cars, and you're seeing all of these big houses that we go by, and there's always a bigger house. There's always a nicer house that's out there. To keep an open dialogue, and this is what I tell my kids, it's like, do you want to look rich, or do you actually want to be rich? And the conversation that we continue to have is, we could have this nice car, 
That means X amount of dollars would be going towards that, which means X amount of dollars that we're going to spend in Europe would go to this nice car. Are you okay rolling up to school in the eight-year-old car that we're going to run into the ground? And so this is just the conversation that we're having. Do you want to look rich? Do you want to pretend that you, you're rich like everybody else and, and go to bed with no money? Or do you want to actually be rich? So that's what we say. We've got, you know, Billy Bob down the street with, with the monster trucks and everything. And, and we know the, the inverse relationship between the size of the truck and the man's, the man's bank account. What did you think I was going to say? The bank account. So you got this monster truck, small bank account, <clears throat> small dick too. And this is, but this is, everyone goes, oh, wow, what a great car. This is great. And we have to talk to our kids about this, that just by looking at it doesn't, it's actually the opposite. So I'll get off my horse about that. Sorry, sorry. That's number one. Talk openly about it, how much things cost, why we buy or don't buy things, and not saying we can't afford it, um, but, and then also, do you want to look rich or be rich? Number two, make them work for money. And so this is something that, in my world, we have two things. We have expectations. These are your jobs that you are responsible for. You do not get paid for them. It's just to keep a roof over your head, to be a part of this family. You do those jobs that's it. But then we also have additional jobs that will pay them. And it also means that if I tell you that work starts at nine o'clock, you better be at the table, fed, ready to go at nine o'clock in the morning and ready to work. And we'll keep track of our time. And at the end of the week, tell me how many hours we work. And then I will pay them right away. And I actually pay my kids $10 an hour net. And that's designed for a couple of reasons. First, it's designed to definitely make it worth their time. Um, it's also designed to help them make spending decisions based on their hour, hourly net rate. Okay, so if they're going to spend $30 on a Fortnite skin then the question that I want them to answer is, are you okay doing the jobs that I've told you to do for three hours in order to buy that skin? If you are okay with that, then go ahead. I just want you to go through that exercise of whether or not you think it's worth it. And then if they decide yes, then I give them full freedom. It's their money to do that. Um, So that's working for their money, understanding that if you earn it, spend it wisely because it's not coming back and I'm not giving stuff for free. I also try to incentivize a little bit if they want to save it. This is now the, the teenager who has uh, his own savings account and we're starting to introduce him to his own debit account that, hey, look, uh, if you have money saved in your account, you're actually earning interest on it now. So he's starting to see that grow a little bit. He's starting to see some of the investments that, that I have set up for him grow a little bit. And uh, that also visually helps him to go, ooh, this feels really good. I don't need to splurge and spend this all on something frivolous. <clears throat> so that's number two. Number three is understanding taxes. So we're not going to make them a, a CPA or a tax expert by any means, but I also, at a very early age, wanted them to understand that here in Indiana, it's a 7% sales tax. So if you're going to spend $10 on a gift, don't come to the counter with $10. Come to the counter with $10.70. So this actually worked very effectively because I remember my kids, even at a really early age of about five or six years old, going to the concession stand with their $5 going, 
well, I, I, I can only buy $4 and some cents because I know there's taxes. And, and the person at the concession stand was like, what the hell are you talking about? Well, I could, they couldn't believe it. But it, they were thinking along those lines that you've you got to pay these taxes in addition to it. So whatever something costs is not just the sticker price. It's what the, the taxes are as well with those sales tax. <clears throat> Besides that, I don't, we don't go into much of that. I think once they get their own first job, they're going to realize that, hey, that $10 net that dad was paying per hour uh, is more like the equivalent of around $12 or $13 or, 13 or $14 an hour uh, working somewhere else. But we'll get there. I know the older one is, is 14, and we're starting to have conversations about what that car is going to look like and he's definitely going to have to put some skin in the game of the cars. So we're starting to think about how, we're gonna sa how he's going to save money, how he's going to earn money in addition to working for dad over the summer. Uh, number four is saving and investing basics. So just showing them... Um, uh, have they have their own stock accounts and showing them what to look for in stocks. Now, in hindsight, I let them choose their own stocks and the stocks haven't performed that well, which is kind of a bummer. I wish, I wish over the last year I would have made them do like an index fund so they could see that money going up. It's kind of flatlining right now, but over the long term, I'll, I don't have an issue with it. We'll keep adding money to it and We'll see that account going up, but I want them to see what interest looks and feels like when you buy a stock. What does dividends? What do dividends feel like in addition to the capital gains or the stock price going up and down? What about that dividend? Uh, and what about the financials of the company? And when you think your kids, well, they can't handle. It. I don't know of anything. They can handle it, and uh, they have quite a. a high bandwidth to just understand the basics of it. We're not doing deep cash flow analysis dives into anything. It's more or less just taking a look at some of the financial highlights, uh, some of the fundamentals of the company, and determining whether or not we like it. So uh, savings and investing basics are really good and just gives them that experiential learning that, hey, look at my money growing and I didn't even have to work for it, and suddenly these additional monies are getting added to my account, I like the feeling. I know I do as an adult like that. I'm trying to show the kids as early as possible what that feeling is like in order to push that behavior even more so. All right, so what we've talked about here, openly talking about it, working for money, and... Uh, getting them to understand, and making their own spending decisions based off of that. Number three, understanding taxes and sales tax. And then number four, saving and investing basics. And as we're talking to kids, this leads us to number five. And this goes back to trying to demonstrate giving and abundance with them. Demonstrate and give with them. And as much as I like to keep my giving or my, uh, uh, yeah, to myself or keep it anonymous. I try to loop the kids into some of these things whenever I can, just so they can see what it looks like, but more importantly, feel what it feels like. So when we're out and about and paying for somebody's groceries or paying for somebody's meal, I'm telling them, hey, after the fact, did you see what we did? And they go, oh, yeah. So, Dad, what you're talking about, you're actually, you, you do this for real. It's like, yeah, how does it feel? They're like, that felt really, really good. It's like, good, you're understanding this. And so now we're just, we're giving them that experience so they can then do this with other people. And you don't have to do it with money all the time. And it's just reaching out, having an awareness of people around you and what they might need and, and reaching out to help just whenever you can. And I've noticed that with the kids, their, their awareness has increased, 
their willingness to reach out and assist somebody has increased, and um, there's nothing that will make me more proud as a dad is to see that come to fruition and watch them to develop that area of their lives. So I'm hoping after we talk about it today that teaching our kids about money isn't that scary, and we don't have to be an expert in the field in order to push and to have conversations with our kids about money. And just as anything else, sometimes it's about sharing our dumb decisions or sharing what, what mistakes we've made in order to, to bring back uh, correction and improvement. So uh, however you want to do that is up to you. My preference strongly, though, is that you just have those conversations, that you continue to talk to them, and that our kids can flourish with their finances. I'll stop for there. I'll stop there. Thank you all very much for listening. If you have questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. I've got five points. I think there are more. I want you to chip in, and uh, maybe we come back and address this again. I'm just starting the conversation, but would love to hear from you. You can reach out uh, any of the platforms, brianfoltis.com or on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, that's where you'll probably find me the best. So hope you all are doing well. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will talk to you next time. By the way, next time we're, di we're digging into the getting married part. Get ready. Talk to you later.